Welcome to episode 45 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery, recognizing that tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this episode is three pillars of libertarianism, freedom of association, where I'll discuss why I believe that freedom of association is a benefit to society. In the last episodes, I discussed the non-aggression principle and self-ownership as being unequivocal rights that each person has. That also included, in the last episode, conversation about how private property and the idea of fraud fit in. Let's continue this series with the last pillar and dive right in. In this series, I discuss the three pillars that I believe are fundamental ideas of libertarianism. Those pillars are self-ownership, the non-aggression principle, and freedom of association. These are not presented to be bulletproof philosophical arguments. If you're watching and are a non-libertarian, you might have wondered what's going on in the mind of a libertarian when they take a stand on some issue. If you're a libertarian, you might have wondered what's going on in the mind of a non-libertarian who just cannot see what feels like the obvious answer to whatever conversation you two are having. Instead of a great philosophical musing, this series is meant to help non-libertarians understand a bit why libertarians believe the way they do and take the stalwart and uncompromising positions as they are prone. It is also meant to provide a different approach for libertarians when talking to their non-libertarian friends. In a fourth episode, following this one, I'll illustrate how each of these pillars plays a role in current or recent topics. The first question someone might have is, why would you boil it down to only three concepts, and these three specifically? The first reason is anytime you can break something down into threes, it is easier to communicate and remember. The second is that these are the most common concepts that I believe impact the day-to-day -day conversations on most issues that people talk about, and they are most relevant to laws that are passed or talked about. Lastly, I think that once people have a simple foundation to work with, conversations that get more complex are a little bit easier to understand and discuss. And most conversations that libertarians and non-libertarians have do end up going from simple to complex pretty quickly. For instance, if I, offer, if I offer opposition to licensing laws and discuss the absurdity of barbers and hairstylists who must first go through training and various legal hoops before opening up shop, it's inevitable that someone will leap to ask if I want an unlicensed brain surgeon operating on me. Understanding the basics helps keep the conversation productive. And that's what we're about here at Liberty Dad, productive conversations. Following self-ownership and the non-aggression principle from the last two episodes is now freedom of association. When I say following, again, I don't mean in a linear sense. It's not literally that self-ownership comes, then non-aggression principle, and then finally freedom of association. But in terms of understanding, I think there is a path to help others understand the value and how they are connected. Fundamental to everything, though, is the right of self-ownership. You own yourself and the things produced from your decision to use your body how you please. And because you own yourself, it becomes logical that you have the right to be free from the aggression of others. They may not harm you, damage, steal your property, or defraud you by intentionally keeping information from you that they know would alter your decision. Freedom of association, in simple terms, is the right to decide who you will associate with and under what terms you will do so. Since you own yourself and others may not aggress against you, you have the right to associate with anyone of your choosing, and others may not interfere, which of course would require the use of force. 
It's often expressed or discussed in the context of the, the right to join, form, or associate with groups. As a pillar of mine, I extend this to any association with another person or group of persons. The easiest example would be the right to, say, invite a neighbor, uh, invite neighbor a, neighbor a over for some drinks, maybe a cigar, and sit around the fire pit while we discuss whatever topics come up. Neighbor B may wish to come over as well, and I might tell him, no, for any reason. Neighbor B might now feel insulted, but can do nothing about neighbor A coming by and him and I enjoying each other's company around my fire pit. In that scenario, it's easy to see both the freedom to associate and freedom not to associate. Now, what if we change the scenario slightly? Well, we can see the same concept at play. Imagine that I invited not just one neighbor over, but both of them, and neighbor B declines. There is no obligation to come over, and it can be for whatever reason that he chooses. Maybe he has an existing obligation that conflicts with the time that I've invited him over. Or maybe he doesn't really like neighbor A, and would prefer to only come over when that neighbor isn't here. Or maybe he just thinks my house is not clean enough and prefers to only go to homes that meet a certain standard of cleanliness. Freedom of association extends to various organizations as well. Say I join a church and one of their requirements is that my family and I attend every single week unless the pastor grants us an exception. And on top of that, we all must attend a certain number of events each quarter to remain in good standing and consequently continue being members. <laughs> it might sound a bit oppressive to some, but consider that there's a valuable point here to be made. And that is first that my family and I have willfully joined the church who has presumably presented us with the rules of the organization up front. My family and I choose to accept the rules and the church chooses to accept us as members, it's a very mutual and voluntary arrangement. Maybe after a while, the rigor of membership becomes too challenging, or we find that we no longer believe the same things and we decide to part ways because we own our bodies and because the non-aggression principle provides that others may not initiate aggression against us, the church can only seek to convince us to stay or simply let us go. The same applies for organizations that instead of some requirement on specific behavior, maybe have monetary requirements. It's a bit rare, but my neighborhood actually has a voluntary homeowner association. I know, right? People are really, really surprised when I tell them that. They're like, what? Wow, that sounds exciting. And it is. At any rate, I digress. My wife and I choose to be members and pay dues, but there is no legal requirement that we do so. We choose to because the lake and the common areas are owned by the homeowners association. And unless we are members, we are not permitted to partake in usage of these, uh, of these uh, items, uh, entities. My church example put requirements on things that we must do to remain as members. Again, associated with the church. My voluntary HOA has no such requirements regarding behavior or actions, so if they choose to have an event, I am not required to partake in it. My only requirement is that I am to pay annual dues and that information is known up front. The HOA, like the church example, has set up the requirements in order for people to become members. Those requirements may be for action, certain payments made, or in some cases, both. Now you might ask yourself, DL, why are you telling me the obvious? Well, what I wanna do is I wanna establish a solid understanding of the freedom of association as understood by libertarians. And I wanna offer libertarians kind of like a way to walk through this with their non-libertarian friends. There is an endpoint, and the progression will help us once we get there. So bear with me as we look at another example. Imagine 
my neighborhood host a garage sale day. The HOA may offer to promote the garage sale as much as they can, even at their own cost. My wife and I, we may realize that we have quite a few things in the house that we no longer have any use for and decide that, uh, you know, we have the time and we'll participate. The day of, we open our garage, we pull out our tables, all manner of items that we no longer wish to keep, we take tape and we scribble prices on the various items and maybe some generic prices for groups of things like $2 for any given shirt. As people come up and they look at all the different things that we have, they do what any person does at a garage sale and they ask, you have this mark for $4, will you take three instead? At that moment, my wife and I may choose to be firm in all of our prices. We may choose to take any offer that gets rid of an item or just wing it from item to item. Imagine that one particular person keeps asking if we'll sell items for much less than marked. Will you take $2 for this $4 item? How about 25 cents for this item that you've got marked for $1? So on. I then decide, right or wrong, that this person is just there to buy stuff for a very, very low price so that they can turn around and sell it for a profit later. I decide that, hey, I would rather try to make that profit rather than sell it and get rid of it for the very low price that they're asking for. After all, it's very early in the day yet. I might hold firm on all my prices, or if I become tired of answering questions, I might tell the person that I do not wish to sell them anything because I feel that they are up to something. I don't know what that something is, but maybe. At any rate, it's a bit rude and a bit of a gamble since I cannot guarantee whether or not I will sell my stuff the rest of the day. They grumble and then they leave. A similar story might play out in any number of ways, but because it's my personal property, I am permitted to sell it or not to whomever I want for whatever reason I want. We might reword it and say, partake in the freedom to associate with the person long enough to complete a financial transaction. A slight better example might be this. Imagine that my roof has a leak and I call out three different roofing companies for a quote. Of those three, one does not contact me back after coming out and even when I bother to try to call them up, I get no response. And then let's say that the other two, they do send back some quotes and those quotes are vastly different. One is very high price, one is relatively low price. Clearly, the first one has chosen for whatever reason not to do business with me. I am left to decide between the other two remaining whether or not I want to call yet another roofing company or if I want to do business with one of those two. Assume that I choose to just decide between the two who did return a quote to me. I may choose the more expensive roofer because he showed up on time, was very thorough in his explanation, and was not dressed up but clearly wearing very clean clothes. Or maybe I choose the cheaper roofer who was a few minutes late, didn't explain nearly as much, and looked like he just left a job site because maybe I wanted the better deal. The reasons I may choose one or the other or to seek out other roofers for quotes are, are many and mine alone. Likewise, the roofer who refused to contact me back may choose to move on and not even consider the job for any number of reasons. The more expensive roofer might have his own reasons for having a higher price. He may think that I have some money and you know that I can spare and that if his presentation is good that I will see past that cost and decide to do business with him. The cheaper roofer, he may really need the money and choose to drop his usual prices very low so that he barely makes any money at all. Between all four of us, the reasons that we will or will not do business with the other are too many to discuss or even count. But like the garage sale, like the HOA, and like inviting my neighbor or neighbors over, this scenario shares the same attribute with all of them. And that is that each person is free to associate with another, one another and for whatever reason they choose. 
This now leads to where freedom of association, as libertarians see it, is seen as a bit of a problem. The one question I get, and it's asked all the time, so you're, all, you're saying it's okay to place a whites only sign on a shop window? And that is literally how the question is phrased, almost always. The problem is that it's asking the question on terms that we don't ask it elsewhere and why I chose the progression I did. When it comes to inviting a neighbor over, multiple neighbors over, excluding one, or being the neighbor who declines, no one ever asks if it's okay. Likewise, that question, is, of, is it okay, is not present when considering whether or not to join a church, an HOA, selling things at a garage sale, choosing a roofing company, or whether a roofing company chooses to, do, to accept a job, or send a quote in this particular case. The question that is asked is only this, do all the parties involved consent to whatever terms are agreed upon? If my two neighbors choose to come over, I might ask neighbor A to bring some chips, and then I might ask neighbor B to bring some salsa, and then tell them that I'll provide some steaks. We all voluntarily agree to these stipulations, or we do not. The matter of whether or not it's okay simply isn't present. The same goes for any of the other illustrating, uh, illustrations that I used. I may choose the more expensive roofer because, after some research, I find out that they have a really great reputation for work. I might also, instead, choose the roofer, the less expensive roofer, and the roofer who chose not to contact me back might have done his own research, and he might have learned that I'm the chair of the Libertarian Party affiliate here in my county, and that I have a podcast where I talk about liberty as I see it, and he may decide he would prefer not to do business with me because of the positions that I take. The question of, is it okay, puts me in a possible position, anyone really, to violate the non-aggression principle and the right of self-ownership. If I decide it is not okay, then I might go ahead and support a law or promote a law that prevents someone from putting such a sign up in their window. And when I do that, I help defraud potential customers who might, just like the roofer in my illustration who didn't give me a quote because of my views, who might not want to do business with businesses that have offensive beliefs. The question of, is it okay, changes how we treat the interaction between two or more people. Rather than see it as a mutual agreement between parties, it becomes a matter of a third party choosing for both of them. The other reason that I chose this progression is because he answers the most common objection. And that objection is, okay, DL, what? If we didn't have laws preventing owners from placing signs like that in their window, then some major company might come along, put others out of business, and then refuse to serve large groups of people. Uh, it's also framed in the context of, say we have a small town and there's only one of a particular shop, they might choose not to serve certain people in that town, and those people in that town uh, are alleged to have no recourse. The answer to that is when society has the full freedom to associate as they choose, the full freedom from non-aggression, the full freedom to self-ownership, it prevents such a scenario from happening. Okay. Where is my evidence? It's in those very illustrations. These sorts of decisions already happen, and yet society does not break down. Historical examples where such a scenario happened always include government support or negligence. Consider the Greensboro Four. That is, the four black men who black men who protested segregation at the Woolworth lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina in the early months of 1960. Here's what happened. Four black men decided that they wanted to protest the segregation rules at Woolworths and walked in one day, sat down at the counter, and ordered coffee. The waitress told them that they were not permitted to be served, but the four men remained 
until closing. The next day, they returned with more people and staged the same protest. By the fifth day, there were over 300 people in protest. The city, at some point, changed its laws, which led to the arrest of 45 of the protesters. That sparked massive protest nationwide. These protests led to a $200,000 drop in sales. That is the equivalent of $1.7 million in 2019 dollars. And it also resulted in a reduction of the sales manager's salary for not meeting his sales goals. That led to a change in the policies. Because Woolworths was legally permitted to engage in segregation, black customers were also permitted to decide if they wanted to give their money to Woolworths, and a number of white customers as well, who supported the goals of desegregation. As it turns out, the black customers did want to give their money to Woolworths, just not on the terms that were being offered and they did a much larger version of exactly what we do every day. They chose under what terms they would financially associate with Woolworths. Now, you might be inclined to say, but DL, they shouldn't have had to do that. And in a sense, that is very true. But I want you to consider, there may be many, many reasons why two parties require the freedom to choose under what terms they do business and how that requires the freedom for each to be as open as they are willing to be. Causes vary over time. One decade, it's racial equality. Another decade, it may be the use of child labor. Another, it may be equality for sexual minorities or women or immigrants. Go on and so on and so forth. As society moves into the future, it changes. What is important to one generation may get resolved or resolved enough so that the next generation can focus on something else. The freedom to associate or not for whatever reason is a constant equalizer for all parties, provided that each has the fullest freedom to determine under what terms they will and will not associate. As bad as racism was in 1960, I want you to think about this for a moment. As bad as racism was in 1960, it was no match for the black community to freely withhold their money and cause Woolworth's financial repercussions. I want to leave you with uh, one last small point to, to think about. Some years ago, I knew a gay man who told me that some gay bars that he had been to would ask patrons to leave if they found out that they were straight. Some had even had signs posted that said, no straights. The reason was that the gay community at the time had enough trouble with people aggressing against them or simply creating a hostile environment. And some bars worked to ensure a place where gay men and women could enjoy an evening out without that worry. I've not heard about this when it comes to racial minorities, but I have heard of organizations doing similar for women, particularly shelters. There's a difference between those situations and segregation, and that is that those situations are done in response to protect particular groups, whereas segregation is not. But consider those are nothing more than an example of the freedom to choose to associate gay bars choosing which clients they will permit and shelters choosing what sex of a person that they will allow to stay at their shelter. But unlike Woolworths, we don't see massive demonstrations against them. And I think that's because most of society recognizes when a given policy is and is not right. And even when it doesn't, when it's not most of society, it's often enough to make a difference like in the case of Woolworths. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to leave me a comment wherever you're watching, whether it's Facebook or anywhere that you're watching, YouTube, what have you. If you didn't see my videos on self-ownership or the non-aggression principle, be sure to check them out. And tune in next week as I discuss how each of these principles applies to common or modern topics in the news. But for now, Let's have a bill review. 
But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. I am not in any way a lawyer. What follows is not in any way legal advice and is not intended to speak in any authority on legal matters. I am only acting in the capacity of a general citizen with the ability to read and interpret a concatenation of words and render an opinion. The goal of the bill review is to promote the idea that everyday Americans can and should take the time to read any legislation, order, or mandate. Since I'm not a lawyer, this isn't a legal interpretation, and I may be wrong. Bills range from a page or two up to many thousands of pages long. And since they can be rather dry, this segment is short and only meant to show you just how much you can learn in only a few minutes. In this episode, I review Kentucky Senate Bill 211, titled An Act Relating to Public Safety. This bill is 40 pages as it amends current Kentucky laws either through deletion, change, or addition. If you saw the headlines about a bill from Kentucky that would criminalize insulting a police officer, this is that bill. This bill actually does several things but seems primarily directed toward dealing with riots and protest. For instance, it adds limitations on receiving public assistance for those convicted of certain crimes such as causing physical injury to various public servants or emergency service personnel. Basically, the loss of benefits correlates to how the statutes already define certain violations. Not a huge argument here. If you're convicted of, say, spitting on an officer or hitting them with a brick, you'll lose your public assistance for some given amount of time. It seems fairly fair because those types of violations tend to be aggression on part of the citizens. I'd like to focus on the part about insults, which can be found on page 20. This portion amends section 525.060 of the Kentucky Revised Statutes titled Disorderly Conduct in the Second Degree. Let's get a sense of what the statute already says before we look at the addition. It currently says this, one, a person is guilty of disorderly conduct in the second degree when in a public place and with intent to cause public inconvenience, annoyance, or alarm, or wantonly creating a risk thereof. He, A, engages in fighting or violent, tumultuous, or threatening behavior, B, makes unreasonable noise, C, refuses to obey an official order to disperse issue to maintain public safety in dangerous proximity to a fire, hazard, or other emergency, or D, creates a hazardous or physically offensive condition by any act that serves no legitimate purpose. It then identifies disorderly conduct as a Class B misdemeanor in Part 2. The first thing to note here is that each of the items in a, uh, in, in a through D are simply acts of an individual that Kentucky has determined to qualify as disorderly. 1B, unreasonable noise, is a bit odd since the word unreasonable is kind of subjective. But at least it requires, as stated in Part 1, it requires the intent of causing public inconvenience, annoyance, alarm, or wantonly creating a risk. In other words, if you're making a lot of noise just to be disrupted to others, you can be found guilty of disorderly conduct. But the addition shifts the tone of this section. It adds in Part E this, E, accost, insults, taunts, or challenges a law enforcement officer with an offensive or derisive words or by gestures or other physical contact that would have a direct tendency to provoke a violent response from the perspective of a reasonable and prudent person. For clarity, Merriam-Webster defines a cost saying to approach and speak to someone in an aggressive, challenging, or aggressive way. Two major things stick out to me as a lay person. Items A through D describe behavior that has a direct impact on the public. For example, if I get into a fist fight at the bar, the fight may bleed over and harm other patrons as I use my five foot three frame to launch someone over the bar. But the addition of E shifts the focus to behavior that impacts a police officer directly because it states that would have a direct tendency to provoke violent response from, a perspective, uh, from the perspective of a reasonable or prudent person. In other words, them's fighting words. And because of that, 
The second major issue is that it provides an excuse for aggressive behavior from officers by blaming people who are saying basically mean things. The first question that I ask is this. If fighting words, so to speak, are a defense for an officer, are they now also an excuse for those that are not part of law enforcement? It would seem that the answer to this is no, since the section on disorderly conduct, and as I pointed out already, items A through D, specifically deal with citizens and the public, not officers. This new addition explicitly only applies to law enforcement. It treats law enforcement officers differently by using the standard of, quote, direct tendency to provoke a violent response, end quote but only calling it disorderly conduct when it happens to police. That isn't fair or equal treatment under the law. I'd further argue that the non-aggression principle should apply to everyone if we were to apply standards differently, then it is police who should be held to higher standards. And making what appears to be an exception for fighting words does not accomplish this. If that wasn't bad enough, section three adds this saying that if the offense is committed during the course of a riot, A, the minimum term of imprisonment shall be three months, notwithstanding KRS Chapter 532, and the person shall not be released on probation, shock probation, parole, conditional discharge, or any other form of early release prior to the expiration of 45 days, and B, a fine of $250 shall be assessed, notwithstanding KRS 534.040, and C, any person convicted under this subsection shall be disqualified from receiving public assistance benefits by means of a direct cash payment or an electronic benefits transfer access card for three months. My read here is that if there is a riot and you say foul things to an officer that might be considered bad enough to provoke someone, anyone else to a fight, then you, may, you can be jailed for up to three months find $250 and lose your public assistance for up to three months. Let's call it what it really is, the tax on the poor. I'm not particularly wealthy, but I could withstand a $250 fine for yelling mean words to an officer. And I'm not on public assistance, so there isn't any danger there for me. That I am unlikely to engage in such behavior is irrelevant, but I am at a clear advantage over my fellow citizens who would be impacted by the fine and loss of benefits. Another problem that I have is making unrelated associations under the law. Going to a protest that ends up in a riot and then using, uh, caught using foul language toward officers is unrelated to public assistance benefits. If you lost benefits because of fraud or maybe using the money for things other than it was provided for, that would be different since it's directly related to the benefits. And using foul language or gestures toward an officer isn't causing any loss of public money. The officer is already present, and there isn't any increased cost created by the use of unsavory language. I hope people in Kentucky demand the bill to be rejected, and I hope that they hold those who presented the bill or voted on it in the Senate accountable as well. The best way to prevent future assaults on freedom of speech is to hold those people who propose them accountable. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head on over to facebook.com free speech media network, where the weekly episode of Just Me airs Monday night at 10 p.m. Or join Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary and me on Friday night at 11 p.m. for a discussion style episode on the same topic. And while you're there, be sure to check out the other free speech media shows. Remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. Have a great week, catch you next time, and I'm out.